Metaphysically speaking, Ibn Arabi was deeply influenced by Philo of Alexandria's ideas of the divine logos as the fundamental principle of life and thought. But he was also in great part influenced by older hermetic writings, and in some instances, his Fusus Alikam paralleled many of the hermetic texts so closely that reading them side by side can easily demonstrate the immense degree to which they overlap. Of particular note is the hermetic discourse of Hermes to Tat. Ibn Arabi writes, God is everything that exists, for he is the creator of all existence. But he is also everything that does not exist, for the non-existent is contained in his essence. He can only be apprehended by the mind, yet can be seen with the naked eye in the forms of the universe. He is immaterial, yet is in every material thing. There is nothing in existence but he, hence he is called by all the names of created beings. He has no special name because he is the father of all. How can I praise thee, O God, and where can I praise thee? Do I look upward or downward, to the external or the internal? For thou art the locus which embraces everything. There is no locus but thee. And what sacrifice can I offer thee? For everything comes from thee. What time do I praise thee? There is no time, no instant of time that is far from thee. With what part of me can I praise thee? Do I belong to myself? Or does anything of myself belong to me? Am I not thou? Thou art I, and thou art everything I do or say. Nay, thou art everything, and there is nothing besides thee. There is a strong current of pantheism in Ibn Arabi in the Hermetic texts, although even this labeling is not entirely correct, but for now let us use it as a marker to signify a more dynamic worldview. In the Hermetic text, the author states, quote, God embraces all things, but things are not contained in him as material objects are contained in a place, but as thoughts which he thinks. And do you say, God is invisible? Speak not so. Who is more visible than God? For this very reason has he made all things, that through all things you may see him. This is God's goodness, that he manifests himself through all things. Nothing is invisible, not even an incorporeal thing. Mind is seen through its thinking and God in his working. God is the all, and there is nothing that is not included in the all. Hence, there is neither magnitude, nor place, nor quantity, nor shape, nor time beside God. For God is the all, and the all permeates all things, and has to do with all things. Or once again in the Hermetic texts, quote, There is not anything in the cosmos, nor has been through all time from the first foundation of the universe, neither in the whole nor among the several things contained in it, that is not alive. There is not, and has never been, and never will be in the cosmos anything that is dead. Listen to this. Nothing is invisible, not even an incorporeal thing. Mind is seen through its thinking, and God in his working. The first excerpt asserts that even so-called invisible or bodiless or unobservable or non-empirical that being non-measurable things, are still visible in essence. They still participate in the real. The second excerpt indicates that the nature of a power can only be apprehended by functional expressions of its dynamis. Mind is seen through thinking. God is seen through his workings. This is an echo of the Democratian adage that like meets like. 
The intention of this video is to try to bring us closer to a worldview echoed by Ibn Arabi and the anonymous authors of the Hermetica, a worldview that they took for granted, but are essential for conducting alchemy and theurgy. There is no way of immersing oneself seriously in these arts and practices if one does not share their fundamental manner of viewing the world. There are thousands of years buried under layers and layers of distortion and misunderstandings. Language changes and so do the meaning of words. But what does not change, what applies today as much as 2,000 years ago, is the relationship of the human to the gods and the natural and supernatural world. In a way, everything has changed, and yet nothing has changed. For it is us who have lost the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the hands to feel, the nose to smell, and the mouth to taste. Our senses are dull. We think we use our senses, but it is in fact our senses that use us. To discover oneself in the act of seeing is to truly perceive. I reiterate Ibn Arabi's famous quote, quote, humans are asleep, at their death they awaken. The majority of people, as they listlessly or energetically walk and drive around you, blindly meandering through life, without hearing the whispering of the leaves as they converse with the winds and hear the birds speaking their angelic songs, are in a sense already dead. If we want to reframe ourselves so that we can authentically approach theurgy or Greco-Egyptian alchemy as best we can, given our cultural and philosophical distance from the ancients, we can assume that the mentality of our archaic Greeks is probably closer to the Egyptian than it is to the modern mind. So it is safe to approach our understandings of the cosmos through an archaic Greek lens. This is a limitation out of necessity. Since Egyptian psychology, the word itself, of course, being an anachronism, besides being more radically different from our own, is also slowly being uncovered in the scholarly world. Essentially, we have much more material that allows us to unveil the Greek worldview, particularly through tragedy and the epic poetry of Homer and Hesiod. Reconstructing a cosmic world, an interdisciplinary task that incorporates art, natural philosophy, history, literature, science, mysticism, religion, and languages. It is an effort that requires a continual transmutation of our experience, and hopefully one day, many years from now, it may cease to become so arduous and deliberate as we slowly strip away our own fantastical preconceptions of the world and our place within it, to find once again our primordial natures and to realize that the gods have been communicating to us all along through every raging storm and gentle puff of air. So let us enter, as best we can, into the mindset of a 4th to 6th century person. This is not an easy task, because it flies against every perceptual conditioning and presupposition over the past couple of millennia. To approach such a frame of mind, to induce such a metanoia, is to abandon all sense of certainty of our perceptual processing. Our acknowledged distinctions between inner and outer, internal and external, subject and object. The study of philology will help us assist in approaching the gods on their terms. And this is crucial for theurgy. Remember, and this is very important, all the gods possess personality in the technical definition of this term, which encapsulates a bond or a relationship. A relationship can only occur if there is a means of communication, and it is precisely through the vehicle of language, through sacred words and divine epithets, that a theurgist can commune with the gods. Another aspect of the gods are not simply their being comprehended by us through words and speech, but that we can understand them through their actions, since acting presupposes a sphere of belonging. 
For example, ritualized and highly formalized sacred dances that require the dancer to make specific gestures at the appropriate point of the music of sequence or moves is following a particular pre-established pattern and acting within its boundaries. By aligning one's body with the contours of the empty form of the dance itself, for example, during the performance of the Apollonian Iporchema, the dancer is imbuing themselves with the power of Apollo, with his aspect of forms and their measured expression in the world. Similarly, as they dance, the rhythm of their body is acting in conformity with the singing choir and the playing of the olos, a wooden instrument. This combination of singing, dancing, and music weave in a well-orchestrated combination that is literally held together by Apollo's powers of performance and musicality. But how are we to understand mental experience? When lightning flashes, floods destroy our homes, wind topples trees, and fires rage, we conceptualize these as forces of nature. But to the Greeks, Nature was also supernatural. In fact, it was a medium of demonic expression, and this could be expressed either through gentleness or aggressiveness. It is not true that the ancients only believed that the gods expressed their discontent and anger and punished humans with the forces of the natural world. The gods were seen to simultaneously use the weather for their purposes and also to actually be the weather phenomenon itself. For example, in archaic Greece, the word belos translates to, quote, a weapon that is thrown, and is associated with the verbs of throwing, hitting, or shooting. In its literary usages, it refers to Zeus's thunderbolts, but is also utilized to describe shafts of snow, of rain, of sunlight, and starlight. Ruth Padel notes that the moon's circle, quote, through javelins from above, or from the sun's shining ray, a clear shaft hit the ground. There's a great temptation of moderns to counter these statements by claiming that the poets are simply utilizing linguistic devices like metaphor or analogy. But these are devices that did not exist in archaic Greece. What the poets express, to a greater or lesser extent, is the worldview that each common person would inherently recognize from their everyday experience when attending a performance, let's say. Symbolic expression, metaphorical expression, analogical expression, object and subject, signifier and signified are all modern concepts. And to apply our mentality to the ancient mentality where no distinction was drawn is one of the most fundamental errors that even academics can fall into. The truth of the matter is that the distinction between inside our bodies and outside our bodies, whether physiological like our organs or psychological like our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, were suspended in an ambivalent and ambiguous relationship. There was a porous relationship between the boundaries of the inside and the outside. For instance, in ancient Egypt, the Nile was not simply a terrestrial river, but was also simultaneously the waters that emerged from the primeval waters of Nun, which surrounded the cosmos. Nun also manifested itself as rain, as well as the fluidic, dreamlike state that we enter into when we fall asleep. As a Pythagorean once said, quote, all the air is full of souls. These demons and heroes send signs of disease and health to human beings. Next time you go outside, listen attentively to the wind. What are the qualities that you sense? The images that come to mind? Note how over time the images themselves become more and more autonomous, not constrained by your thought processing. This is meant to be difficult and to take time. Be patient with it, but know that it is also there to communicate when you are ready for it.
So what is the difference between the wind that rustles the leaves on the trees and the breath that we inhale and exhale every day? Wind, of course, is an external force, something conceived from the outside. And breath implies that its source emits from the internal structures of the human body. But the causality was always indeterminate, at one time inside, at another time outside. The breath is commonly described in Greek tragedy and understood by the ancient Greeks themselves as breathed, quote, by the friend. As discussed in a previous video, the frenes were identified loosely as the diaphragm region and was a source of intense emotion and prophetic insight. The force of prophecy came from those called ingastromitoi, belly speakers. Is there really a substantive difference between these types of wind and breath? Is the breath inside you not dependent on the forces of the breath without, that is, the wind, the pneuma? When winds shake the frenies, therefore, there are demonic as well as breathy resonances. Hatred and fury are gusts in the mind, but can also be located outside the body, in the air. This is not a personification in our sense of the word, that being a tool to dismiss the reality of something. Again, these things were not viewed from some objective, detached, rationalizing stance. This personification was an articulation of the dynamic movements of non-human agencies. In the archaic Greek mentality, emotions can arise from the inside, but they're most likely attributable to externalized forces from without that act through the pneuma or winds or breath and affect our internal organs of perception and sensation. Antigone's soul suffers, quote, blasts of the same winds as when she persists on challenging her uncle Creon. Sexual desire is seen as a storm in Sappho's fragment 47, quote, Eros tossed my frenes as a whirlwind falls on oaks in the mountains. Helen's father let her choose among her suitors, quote, wherever Aphrodite's noe breaths or winds might take her. It is Aphrodite's winds that enter Helen, affecting her physical organs and facilitating her decision. Again, like in an earlier video, Tito, the maiden of Aphrodite, who is the embodiment of persuasion, exercises her influence. But through the winds of Aphrodite, persuasion is completed through dulcet words that soothe and coax. These are the soft winds, soft emotions that compel the soul to take a particular action or make a certain decision. Again, the inside and the outside are blurred. Ruth Padel notes that in Aeschylus' play Agamemnon, the tragedian decides to emphasize and focus in on the breathing of Agamemnon as he makes his final decision whether to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia, describing him as, quote, breathing with sudden hitting words. The boats that are being beaten by the wind in the harbor are mirroring the winds that are flowing as Agamemnon's breath as he makes this life-altering decision. The external environment is essentially mirroring the internal emotional state of the individual. These are not just creative and poetic licenses. What we fail to observe in the cosmos, whether inside or outside us, is the pattern and similarity, the common denominator if we prefer the overarching movement, that unifies all of these disparate images, actions, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. All of these phenomena whether manifesting in the external world or manifesting in the internal world, are expressions of movement, the movement of forces. Emotion is a movement. Desire is a movement. Wind is a movement. Fire is a movement. Here's a lengthy quote from Ruth Abel. Thought is also wind-like. In Homer, Gods move, quote, swift as thought. 
Prophecies, laments, curses, dreams, songs, and words are winged. Wind-like, they fly and hover in the air. Emotion is wind, breath, or what flies in it. The mind itself flies. When people are mad, very afraid, drunk, angry, youthfully reckless, or much in love, their soul or thimos or noose flies. The soul returns at death to the air, the element of which it is made, and flies down winged to Hades. Air, breath, wind are the soul's element. Tragedy, like medicine, knows that breath, wind, or flying things will and must come in. All we can do is hope that those breaths will be gentle, light, and nourishing. The element of fire is also demonic. You may recall that Empedocles believed that each of the elements are actual eternal divinities. Now in ancient Egypt, there was no distinction between gods and demons. Gods were referred to as demons and demons referred to as gods. Quote, the plague bringing God is pirphoros, meaning fire bringing. Words for fever, piretos, derme, are words for burning and heat. Emotions have a fiery burning quality. Menos, a form of anger. Kolos, similar to black bile. Madness, desire, fear, hope, anger. Boil in or burn your innards. Psychological trauma is precisely this form of injury that our innards, the internal organs of emotional and sense perception, endure. Desire sets human beings on fire and drives the mind just as a god drives a plague-ridden city. Driving emotion or madness both is and is like a driving daemon. Moderate hope and joy warm the innards with comforting glow akin to wine. To be made by Hephaestus is to be made by fire. What all this indicates is that whether physiologically, psychologically, mythologically, cosmologically, all of these phenomena are simple modalities of the one and the same element of fire. Here's a particularly helpful example. The face this is strongly associated with esoteric and magical traditions in antiquity and he has sorcerer and magician-like qualities expressed through his metallurgical art. In chariot racing, the horse, as a chthonic creature associated with the gorgon, who embodies the sense of terror, as can be seen here in Fuseli's The Nightmare, charioteers needed to tame its instinctual tendencies to bolt and toss their riders. Therefore, Hephaestus produced the bit, or what is also known as the mullen. In ancient Greek, this is called the Kalinoi. The violent nature of the horse is pacified once this bit is placed within its mouth. Therefore, it becomes referred to as a philtron, or pharmakon, or teras. The word teras also suggests a supernatural power that is found within the bit. Of course, Kalinoi was born from the fiery furnaces of Hephaestus' metallurgical workshop. Because the horse possesses a violent and fiery nature that flames up spontaneously, Pindar described the bit as a damasifron, a special bond that fetters the horse's nature. But the fiery origins of the bit counteract and subdue the fiery nature of the horse. So once again, like meets with like because there's a secret correspondence between the two of them. As Pedel rightly observes, quote, fire is divine violence, fast, asymmetrical in its movement, a multiple blast, destructively creative. But also through its creativity is able to subdue, to bind and calm a fiery nature. Now, fighting fire with fire might sound absurd and even counterproductive, but the metallic bit represents a colder fire than the hot fire of the horse. In that way, they can neutralize one another.
Artemidorus writes in his interpretation of dreams that for young men dreaming of being burnt alive signifies the irrational impulses and erotic desire. Carl Gustav Jung, in his Man and His Symbols, relates a similar passage. Quote, I can confirm by a modern dream the element of prognosis or precognition that can be found in an old dream quoted by Artemidorus of Daldus in the second century AD. A man dreamed that he saw his father die in the flames of a house on fire. Not long afterward, he himself died in a phlegmone, fire or high fever, which I presume was pneumonia. Fire can manifest itself in a cunning way, embodied by the hermetic fire of Hermes, the fire that is used for cooking and associated with rubbing of two sticks together. Once it has been momentarily created, it cooks the meal for which it was created and is quickly put out again. This is in opposition to the Hephaestian fire, the prototypical alchemical god whose furnace is unceasingly operational, melting mineral ore and fusing oppositional metals together. Hence the story of his netting and capturing Ares and Aphrodite in bed. This is a powerful and intense fire that consumes and flares up due to the wind that is feeding it from the enormous bellows. We find here a connection between air and fire. In another instance, Aeschylus, the tragedian, describes a man, quote, breathing Ares, a martial rage that is exhaled from this man's lungs. The man who is overcome by the warrior spirit is a man whose very breath is war itself. There is a strong ambiguity between the inside and the outside because fundamentally they are both two sides of the same coin. Or, as Empedocles suggests, all matter, both outer and inner, quote, came from the same things. Returning briefly to our Arabic authors in regard to the Hermetica, there is a text known as, quote, the Book of Balunus, the Philosopher. In light of our discussion, let's review a lengthy passage and see if we can perceive the underlying forces and operations behind the descriptions. Quote, Every movement issues from the power which moves all things. For there are two kinds of movement, the potential and the actual. The former preserves all the parts of the world and moves them internally. The latter encompasses the world and moves it externally. The two kinds are inseparable. Nature brings individual things into being it preserves them and sows the seeds of life in the matter. When matter becomes hot on account of movement, it turns into fire and water. And when fire acts upon water, it dries a part of it, which becomes earth. When heat, cold, moisture, and dryness are mixed together, in a certain proportion, spirit is generated. Like the author says, quote, when heat was generated from movement, it accelerated it and matter became extremely agitated. This state lasted for 26,500 years. Owing to this movement, matter was divided into different kinds according to weight and 12 strata were formed. The lowest stratum was void of movement and heat, but acquired heat from the strata above it and was thus set in motion. The parts which became warm rose up, and other strata were formed. Each consisted of seven parts. This was the beginning of the seven heavens and seven earths. Gods may send emotion, be within the emotion, or be the emotion itself. Emotions are the weapons of the gods, the habitation of the gods, the manifestation of the gods, and the medium of the gods. As Pedel states, quote, fighting emotion in oneself or in others may therefore mean fighting God. Phaedra enacts a theomachia against emotion in herself. To fight God at work in others or self 
ends ultimately in destruction. Self-control was an ideal in 5th century Athens since passions goad us to destruction. Tragedy is drawn to the paradox that we must try to fight destructive emotion despite its divinity and despite the fact that fighting divinity is both impossible and wrong. So why then is the god Hermes and his mercurial spirit considered the locus of operations for alchemy and theurgy? This is an important question. But if you follow the hints in this video, you will see that beneath all the variable images, whether they're expressed through tragedy, cosmology, medicine, psychology, or philosophy, you'll notice that the phenomena of the world around us, whether expressed in varying ways to the winds of emotion that turn the frenies of a person, to the winds that batter the ships in the harbor, to the winds that we inhale and exhale that stimulate the metabolic fires within our bodies, you have to perceive the hidden thread that links all these disparate elements together. And that requires an ever-vigilant, ever-focused individual in order to interpret the multiplicity of signs and signals from a fluid, protean nature that says one thing at one time, then paradoxically asserts the complete opposite at another time. This is the hermeneutic of the arch hermeneut. Hermes Trismegistus. Not only is he the god of communication and language and speech, but he himself acts as a liminal figure that bridges boundaries. He brings you from speech to silence and from silence to speech. As a psychopompos, he leads the souls from the light of day to the darkness of the underworld. And like his caduceus staff with two intertwining serpents, he is the master of opposites because he unites them and ultimately helps us master the divide between our inner worlds and our outer worlds. Take care for now.